Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. Today on the show, I meet an artist that reached out to me on the West Coast by the name of Joseph Aruda. And he does, he actually has a background working with DeviantArt. I was really surprised and excited, kind of, because I've always been a weird fan of DeviantArt, but I always feel like I use it and then I don't. And then I'm like, oh yeah, go back and use it again. He used to do uh, work for DeviantArt. And we talk a little bit about that. He has a computer sort of background and also an artist. He does like acrylics and paintings and uh, gouache and all kind of really cool artwork. I, and again, it's one of those things where and I think I say it to him in the show. It's like, it's one of those, his art style is one where it's like, that's what I wanted to be when I first started out. I just couldn't do it. But I love his stuff. It was a great conversation. Super nice guy. Here is my interview with Joseph Aruda starting right now. Where is it that you're located right now in the world? I am in sunny San Jose, California, about 45 minutes south of San Francisco, for those that are not aware of the geography. Well, and, you know, uh, California is so small. I mean, it's just, you know, in one of two places, right? <laughs> there, is, there is the classic problem of anyone who comes to visit. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm going to come see you. I'm like, how close are you? And they're like, oh, we're going to be flying into Los Angeles. I'm like, you've got a six-hour drive ahead of you. <laughs> they're like, oh, you know. Yeah, there's actually like – different climates in California. It's so large. <laughs> There's, Northern California is not the same. <laughs> no, not at all. It's, it's a, it's a very common thing to do here when you're in your college years to do, at least it was when I was, when I was in college was to do a, um, you know, ocean to mountains thing where, you know, either in spring, you know, late, uh, early spring or late autumn where it's like, Hey, let's get up early in the morning and either drive to the coast and have a morning swim and then drive up into the Sierras and go, skiing or snowboarding or right. do it in the reverse Typically, for people who are a little bit inland like me. It's like, Nope, go to Lake Tahoe, get a couple of runs in and then go to the ocean, get a couple of laps in. Can I and, just say and, though, all of those options are still pretty cool options regardless. I mean, go to the ocean, go to Lake Tahoe. I mean, come on, man. No, <laughs> Look at all the no, cool no, stuff. You know, <laughs> you know, but, but people are like, you actually do that. I'm like, yeah, we yeah can. It's, I know it's, it's, it's a perk. You may as well take advantage of it if you can. Absolutely. How long have you lived out there? I was, I'm a born and raised, uh, you were? Okay. Really, people I'm born and raised from Silicon, in, in Silicon Valley. And they're like, people were from there. I'm like, yeah, we're from. they don't hey. all just show up. Some hey. people showed up and then had kids and we stuck around. Right. And here's a question. Okay. This is just my own ignorance. And since I have you here and you brought it up, something I've always, it's like one of those things. I never think to look it up when I have the opportunity and always forget and never got the answer. Did it get called Silicon Valley because of the tech movement there? Or was it always called Silicon Valley? No, believe it or not, and, and I'm in my mid to late 40s, so when I was a kid, it was still called, uh, it was just starting to be called Silicon Valley. It had normally, its nickname for many decades, because it was big on agriculture, uh -huh. was the Valley, the valley of, of, of the Earth's Delight, or the Garden of the Earth's Delight. Okay. There's so much agriculture here, and, and it was, you know, that was, that was the shtick that was kind of placed on it. It became Silicon Valley because I think by the mid-80s, the semiconductor industry had really taken off. Okay. And, you know, Apple had, had popped up, you know, uh, Windows was based out of Redmond, but they're, they had, they had presence here and you had a whole bunch of big Unix companies. I actually started my tech career at a place called Sun Microsystems, which was a pretty big giant in the nineties. Oh yeah. And by that point it was, it, it became very rapidly. It's Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Sure. You know, which has no real geographic markings. It's just like, Oh, if you're kind of in the Bay area, sort of near where the tech companies are, you just call yourself that. Right. Yeah. I, well, and I always wondered if it was just one of those happy, uh, like happy coincidences, kind of like doctors named Dr. Apple, you know, like, you know, the, uh, the healthy doctor, you know, one of those things where, or, or the ironic ones where, oh shoot, now I can't think of it, but I have a dentist who has a great name for an optometrist. It, one of those things. It's like, why didn't you go into optometry? Your name would be perfect for that. And instead he went into dentistry. Of course, I'm forgetting that name right now. So moot point. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so you're living out there and then uh, you were working in the tech industry. Were you always doing art uh, during that time period too? I'm, I'm the classic kid who started doodling it, you know, you know, you're five years old. You're trying to draw the Sistine Chapel on your parents' living room wall. Wait, wait, like, wait, no. wait! You're drawing. No, most kids are like drawing Scooby Doo. You're drawing. <laughs> you're doing Sistine I, Chapel. I grew up in a very, grew up in a very household. Okay, All <laughs> I right. wasn't actually trying to be that ambitious, probably. But I, I did like religious iconography at a young age. Uh, I'm now very much an agnostic, but I definitely grew up in a classic 
um, almost stereotypical. If, if you're familiar with Portuguese culture, it's it's that, that typical Southern Mediterranean thing where it's like you know Catholicism is heavily a part of the fabric of it. Okay. So I grew up with that imagery. So some of that, some of that you know, stays with you. It never quite leaves. But yeah, at a young age, started doodling, never quite stopped. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's been a perpetual part. Art has been a perpetual thread since at any point that I can remember. But you went on to pursue a career in the tech industry. I I had a really convoluted path. I actually, by the time I got to university, I wanted to go into into government. I wanted to work for like the State Department or the Congressional okay. Research Service. And I don't think degree, I ever wanted to do that. In, I love the analysis. I still, I'm still a total wonk. I watch C-SPAN for fun. I'm that kind of guy. Oh man. Um, but uh, I I I love tech and I loved art and I've tried to find ways to kind of commingle those things whenever I can. Um, you know, it's it's. You know, I live in an area that's not particularly known for its art scene, although in particular San Jose has a great local growing culture of, of its artists. I have a studio space just a couple of blocks from where I live here in downtown. Oh, really? And uh, it's a group space, and it's it's the – for me, most of my life, I didn't want to be in a, in a communal studio space. I just uh, – I, I saw most of them as a little bit too niche, like, oh, we're all – you know, uh, plein air painters or, oh, we're all urban artists or, oh, we're all, you know, pick a theme and they kind of grouped together. And, and the one that I found here, it happens to be called Local Color, is just really, it's like, their only connecting thread is we're all local artists. We're all, we all represent kind of what's what's here. And we've got guys who are professional sign painters in that very kind of classic vein. We've got folks who are, you know, your urban artists, your graph artists. We've got folks that do, uh, there's 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 one gal there who does amazing work. That's kind of I call it the Audubon Society. Like she does amazing huh. uh, plant life, animal life uh, paintings. And so the group has a shared identity in in our locality. But beyond that, we're kind of all the different flavors of you. You know, here, here's all the Baskin Robbins flavors of what San Jose has. And I I when I saw that group popping up, I naturally gravitated that way. That felt pretty natural to me. How did you so, come across the that group? Pure dumb luck. Oh, really? Uh, okay. I, I I had moved into downtown about eight or nine years ago from the Burbs. Okay. And uh, uh, a friend of mine had recommended me to. There's a, a local rag for for arts and culture in San Jose. They had interviewed me, and then that the series of connections kind of eventually led me to to those folks, to local color, and I was immediately drawn in because it was it was a very inclusive group. They had um, initially. Uh, through assistance with the city, they had taken over 20,000 square feet of an old Ross store. The, the building was going to get eventually demolished to build mm. this uh, high rise. That was a couple years off. So they got the space on the cheap. Artists could you know, uh, rent studio space really affordably. And you had a repurposed 20,000 square foot Ross store uh, as a play space, which yeah. was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, now that space is actually finally getting demolished. I have moved into a secondary space, which is a former kitchen supply store. <laughs> uh, which is kind of fantastic. Like it, it's great because the spaces have their own personalities, and you got to get, get to embed yourself into it. But uh, but yeah, I found it through through just naturally networking and trying to 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 see what what the local scene had to offer. Okay, having kind of operated on the periphery of it throughout my my adult life up until that point. Okay, when you say naturally networking, like what what would you say some of your networking? I want to say aspects. That's not right. Uh, techniques, uh, I guess. <laughs> uh, technique, well, I mean, in my case, um, I'm not. I'm not too much of a delicate flower, so I. I, I okay. I, I have a dent-proof ego, but it's not. You know, like I have no problem kind of like showing up at events, kind of going, "Hey, that's really cool," and you know, just kind of. I, I will engage any conversation that's that's available that people are. You know, you know. So I started going to every opening I could because there was. There is so much interesting stuff. I'm like, oh, there's yeah. an art opening down the street. Oh, hey, there's another one over there in that neighborhood. I'll go over to that. And eventually you start seeing some of the same faces. Eventually they're saying, hi, oh, are you involved with X? And then it just kind of happens. It, like, I didn't go seeking out the hi, because I am not right. the hi so much. I, um, I don't think a lot of people are. I think that gets overblown. I, I, I don't think I run yeah. into too many people that are that way. <laughs> Yeah, but when you start start seeing the same faces and you start like, oh hey, you were the last thing over there, and you, you know, like those kind of conversations are much more natural. Yeah, and since you're at the same place, trying to look at the same things, you you have the same interests, it becomes a lot easier to kind of, oh hey, what's up? How's it going? Oh, were you th see the thing last week over there? Oh no, Should, is it still going on? You know, that's really the, the the bulk of it. Right. And with social media, eventually you start you start trading handles, 
and then you find out, oh, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so follows so-and-so, who's also an artist. Oh, that's actually really interesting. I'm that's go. how I do it, yeah. <laughs> a, great, a great example, when I, when I moved into local color, I eventually became an artist in residence there, and I realized that there were two or three people in the space that I had been following in some cases for a couple of years, mm. and they just happened to be there. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm told, oh, you're him. <laughs> Oh, you're her, and you're kind of, like it's a it's a fantastic feeling because all of a sudden you kind of feel like you you've made it, yeah, <laughs> in a way, because um, these are people that you actually are really interested in. You're you're you respect them, you know, you know, and and it's kind of like that was a that was a pretty neat feeling right there. But oh, yeah, yes. it's nice to find you 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 actually make a face or a name to the face or face to the name, right? Um, so yeah, that 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 was my networking. Okay, which has worked so far. Valid, yeah. No, that's all. All that makes sense. It, it really is the, the hardest part is the uh, doing it in public thing, but the uh, following people through uh, other people that you like on social media type stuff. I, that's always an easy thing to do. It, at least it's a good start. I know that. I mean, that's, that's what I started out as. Then the problem is, <laughs> then the problem is, is you end up having like uh, 10,000 people that you follow and then you rarely see anything on your social media feed, especially on Instagram. That's the one drawback. And you can't just go and start deleting stuff that you're like, oh, maybe I didn't want to follow that. And then I feel bad. I can never delete. Even when someone unfollows me, I'm like, yeah, but I still like what you're posting and uh, I'll keep it. You know, <laughs> I, I, I hit that dilemma. I mean, it's it goes in basis because I mean, for me, like I do follow a decent number of people, but um you know, at some point, some some are definitely busier than others. Right. Like I'm, I whip out. I mean, I, I use Instagram primarily as kind of less a promotion object and more of a here is my running kind of here's my tab tab of what what's going on in my life on any given point in time. Right. Because I draw daily, so if anything looks remotely good, it goes up in whatever state it's in. Right. You know. Um, I try to prove that you know I try to prove to mom that I'm actually feeding myself, so I think it's just. <laughs> That way you um, don't have to call. <laughs> are you starving yourself? No, ma. No. Um, you know, I, I, I try to hit the, the trails pretty often. So there's often like, you know, kind of whatever running travelogue of where I'm, where I'm going to. So it, it functions pretty good for that. But, you know, so, you know, there are people who also dump daily tons of stuff. And it's like, and some people don't post for weeks or months right. at a time. So in the end, it kind of mostly balances out. I've actually only removed people that I've been following a handful of times. So I think, I still haven't reached a point where it's totally super saturated. Right. But I am probably missing some things because Instagram's stopped doing the, the fully chronological bit and they, right. they, the algorithm. And I've heard as of this week, they're going to be making more changes. So yeah. It's more like, watch. but I, I think humans are somewhat, and I think if you're an artist, there, there's a little obsessiveness in you by design. Like I am that classic example of a person who has way too many books mm. of which only read about really? half. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, geez, I've got too much of that. You know, I've got, I, 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 for many, many, many years, I was an obsessive record and, and CD collector. I yeah. saw a ton in storage. It's, it's just way too many. You know, it's like if I didn't listen to another note of new music and just started listening to my collection, it would be years before I was done. Mm -hmm. I just have too much, right? So, you know, there's, there's a point where you're just kind of like, what is the natural path of human behavior? Well, I'm going to keep accruing stuff anyway. I guess I can kind of, pretend that I'm, I'm tempering the, the, the intake, but you right. know, the heart wants what it wants. You're like, you know, you're, Ooh, I like that. And you like, and so, you know, at some point you just, you just accept it and, and, or at least for me, it's just, okay, I'm just, I'll accept it and move on. Right. Yeah. And speaking of the, uh, I mean, we could go on about social media all day, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about you. And uh, what I would like to know, first of all, is there's uh how would you describe, or, or at least what's the, what's the, uh, the pitch that you have for what your art is, because there, there are a couple of different aspects to it. So I'd like to know how you would describe it. Uh, I have struggled with trying to describe it for a long time. I realized years ago, I made a mistake in trying to lump everything together. I probably should have created a bunch of false identities and been, been a one man army of artists. Um, <laughs> but I am, I am multi, I am, you know, mixed media and I, I work in a couple different genres or, or, or styles, for lack of a term. Yeah, most of the stuff I'm known for is either really um, heavily, you know, high color, high texture, abstract work, mm -hmm. or stylized portraiture. Yeah, They're kind of the two are very disparate, kind of in where they they sit to each other. But I've, I, you know, like I've worked as a video game concept artist. Um, 
I've done I've done pet portraits, which you know are not my thing, but some people really like them, and I'm I'm you know it's like I'll I'll do it if your pet's cute. Sure. <laughs> I like um, that. That's the standard. <laughs> I've, done, I've done, you know, surreal illustration work, sci-fi stuff. I've kind of, I, I kind of dabbled because my tastes are really disparate and I've never been really good about going, Oh, I'm only going to focus on this. I'm like, no, I'm interested in drawing this thing. Right. And it's actually part of the reason why I didn't choose to do art as a primary career driver. I, I've occasionally jumped into that field and I've jumped back out. Um, but people are like, Oh, you're not a professional artist. I'm like, no, I'm a professional artist. I do paid commissions and I, Mm-hmm. I sell and license my work to people for book covers and CD covers. I, I do all all the things a professional artist does. I prefer, provide certificates of authenticity and all those things. Oh, wow. But I choose to do it as the side hustle intentionally so that it never loses its allure and it never becomes work. Okay. I, can choose commission, I can choose commissions when they interest me as much as, like the pecuniary interest isn't the only driver, mm-hmm. right? It's like, oh, you want to commission me to do X. That's not really interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, so even even at market rate, that's not really that interesting, and I can pay my rent. So, uh, or conversely, if someone, you know, if I might have to reduce my rate a little bit, but their idea is super interesting, mm-hmm. I can still I can still get a nominal. Like I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not getting you know shanked on 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 a proper pay rate, but I might make a discount because it's a really interesting idea. They're going to be happy. It's like it's a guarantee. They're going to be happy with what I provide them because they're coming to me for something that I do. Yeah, I'm going to. Enjoy doing this because the idea that they have is in my wheelhouse and it's a cool idea, everyone wins, right? So the, the ability to choose that as the ultimate kind of endpoint for what I'm doing, besides the stuff that I do purely for my own edification, right, makes it a lot more fun as it never loses its allure. It never becomes a chore. It never becomes a, a like, oh God, man, you know, this is a grind. And, and I've been lucky that I've, the closest I ever got to that was when I was doing the concept work for a video game company. Where I did that for a year and a half, and I, there were large parts of it that I enjoyed. But then you'd get these assignments like, "We need you to draw trees, right, for the next three. Just draw nothing but every kind of tree you can, in every, like in all dimensions." And I'm like, "How many trees do you need? Like all of them?" And you're like, <laughs> "Can't you just copy paste?" <laughs> At some point, your it was a, it was a sci-fi theme, you know, uh, multiplayer. Uh, it was a uh, large-scale multiplayer game. Okay. And I was just like, well, I get to draw crates now for for three days. So, it, and is this concept art? Is that actually art that gets used in the game? Or are you creating the concept for like storyboards or layouts or like what does the concept oh, art entail? At that point, the game company was really small. We were just starting out. I was the first. So everybody did everything. I assume. <laughs> yeah, so I, I did all of the concept art until we hired. You know, we started hiring the you know, the animator staff and everything and it was like okay design everything like okay I was working with the the founder of the company to kind of storyboard out bits I was designing all the initial character ideas the the basic like the color palettes and all that I was doing all the the art direction kind of basically okay. to start and if we hired more people it became a collaborative thing but nonetheless you were a small crew of people so you know you're like okay I guess I'm drawing shoes for the next week like <laughs> What do boots on this world look like? Well, you'll come up with a few options. And and that was the closest it got to a grind because you just realized it's like, oh, this is going to have to follow a very linear path and it's going to be like, it, it, it's not going to, it's not going to take, part of the fun for me when I'm working on something is kind of meandering like there's parts I know I'm going to do because, oh, I'm commissioned to do this and yeah. this is the general idea of what the end point is. But how I get there is, you know, it's kind of choose your adventure, right? It's like, I'm going to figure out how I'm going to get there mm-hmm. on my own terms. When you're doing the concept art bit, it felt a lot less so. It felt like here's your track, right? Go, you know, and and that that actually confirmed it for me because this was 21 years ago when I when I did this. Okay. And I'm like, this is exactly what I was scared of, and this now confirms it. So I'm not doing this gig again. <laughs> uh, and ever since then, I've been much much happier. <laughs> what did you go off on to, or what did you go off to do after that? I went back into tech. Okay, um, you did. And 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 I like working in tech as as a day gig. You know, I'm I'm a tech junkie. Like when you you know you had mentioned you have a Linux gig. I worked for a company called VA Linux Systems. I worked for Sun Micro. Okay, it's very much my house. But um, that was also the period where I started discovering like art software. Like I still need to do everything part of it in analog. I will never give up paint. I will never right. give up pencil. I agree like with you 100. <laughs> percent But I've actually spent most of my adult life figuring out processes that meld kind of analog and digital together. Um, 
a lot of the abstracts that I do are built from work on a canvas, mm -hmm. let it get to the stage, I'll let it dry, and then I literally take it and I plonk it on top of a scanner and I start scanning bits that I like. Do you really? And they become samples. Yeah, they become samples that I then keep in a giant library. I've got, I've got about three terabytes of nothing but my own samples, which I periodically put more stuff into, and then I start picking pieces when I start thinking of a new idea to work on, mm -hmm. and I start Einsteining new ones together. Like I have some paintings that are sometimes built from some similar bits but look nothing alike because the ultimate result has been stitched and torqued from, from different spots. I dig and that. In fact, and it, yeah, and in fact, it's like it's a it's it's um, it's a very hip hop thing to do in a lot of ways. But it's like yeah, let me take some weird samples that don't seem to make sense together and then come up with a cohesive end result. That right. It's a surprise because once again, especially for the abstract stuff. It's a very Zen thing for me. I'm just I'm feeling my way through taking the stuff that I've already done before, and I might have recollections of how I arrived at these different pieces, and then I go, okay, oh, this is looking totally different than what I had even thought it might be, but it's looking cool, so I'm going to keep going with this. And sometimes you surprise yourself, but um, yeah, I fascinated with the technology for for facilitating that kind of stuff. There's obvious benefits to like, oh, I can tweak colors or I can mess with contrasts and play with the histogram and you know, you know, the, the actual stitching and masking and doing stuff. Um, but I think there's more to it than that. I think it actually facilitates different conceptual way of working with your own stuff. Yeah. Uh, and there's also stuff out there like I love arabesques and I like, you know, patterns and textures. So I have tried to find software like that lets me write my own filters, that lets me create my own effects. That nice. I'm kind of strictly my own thing. Um, so I, I, but I, I can never switch to one side or the other fully. Like if I had to pick between the two, I would probably go straight back to analog by preference. There's something about the kinetic feeling of working into a surface that I, like that nothing else really replaces. Yeah. But I love being able to bounce between the two and, and keep iterating on, on like, oh, I did that piece six years ago and it was mostly crap except for that one spot. I'm going right. to scan that. And do something with it, right? You don't know what it is, and, and you know, someday, somewhere down the line, you know, there's paintings that I've I have finished in the last year that parts of them probably started 15 years ago. Nice. That were just like, they were just DOA, and you're like, there's something I can do with that thing. I don't. Uh, let me scan it and figure it out. You know, and then you you all of a sudden, oh, damn! I got I figured something out. Right. How, so, how big of a scanner do you have? I've got. A, I mean, it's. Uh, it's like a 12 by 16. Okay. No, it's, it's like a 9 by 14. It's, it's one of the slightly bigger ones. It's not the full large scale ones. But you're really still not, you don't have one like as big as the canvas behind you. No, I have to sample it in chunks. There's just no way gotcha. to go around. That's what I, I wanted what, to know. In a way, it's a good constraint. Like it doesn't, like you have to be, it forces you to have to be discerning about what you're, you can't be lazy. You have to go, what do I really care about in this image? And mm -hmm. if, it, if it's bigger than the scanning bed, how much bigger is it? So I'll scan it and then stitch it together so it's properly coherent. Yeah. But but it, it makes you have to be discerning, and you're like, okay, I, I'm I'm not gonna just like scan the whole thing and and right. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to think about it. What do I care about? Yeah, and you'll take the different parts of it, and that's what you'll scan. Okay. And then the the other thing I wanted to know too, and the reason I asked that is because you said you had terabytes of files. Which first of all, do you have them on your own server? I'm assuming. Yeah, I have them on multiple drives, which I you know backup redundantly because I'm just always terrible. Having worked in tech, I know what happens when backups don't. I've learned back. my lesson that way. Yes. I, 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 me, I got a NAS drive at my house once and I was like, cool, I finally set up my own server and I had it. And then one day I came home, I'm like, what's that clicking noise and lost everything. <laughs> and I had no backup to it. And it says to create a backup and there's even a slot for it to do a backup to, and I'm like, well, I don't want to buy another server. Now I know why I had to. So anyway, yeah. Sorry, that's my sob story. Never mind. Um, anyway, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, so with those, the other reason I wanted to ask that is because um, with all those terabytes, how do you organize them to, do you just randomly go through and like pick stuff or how are you finding stuff or going, I'm going to save that for later? Like after a while, it gets overwhelming. I mean, even looking for photos for crying out loud of my family is just like, where's that picture we took? Uh, maybe it was on this day, <laughs> you know? I can't, I can't say my system is great, but this is the other benefit of having worked in tech most of my life is that um, I actually, for at least all of my, my professional projects, I actually use a tool called Trello. I actually use oh, a okay. on board from like agile methodology, which is used for software development yeah. to kind of track, you know, is it in a, like if I have an idea for something, I'll put it into its own little note card. If I start working on it, it moves over into the slot of in progress and it might sit there for however many weeks, months, 
years it'll be. Yeah. Um, and then it's kind of like, you know, once it's completed, then I have kind of a checklist of things in terms of how I publish it out to, to, to stuff. But I, I kind of track things that way in terms of what I'm working on. Now, as far as I, how I deal with all the files, I've over the years, every couple of years, I have to kind of refactor my process because I, I think of a better way to do it because eventually just the volume of files, it does get problematic. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of it's just structured kind of like I've got a tree structure based on certain themes that I, I kind of come back to over and over again. So I know they're roughly going to be in, there's about a dozen categories, I think, at this point. Okay. And it's a tree structure. And, and within it, like, as I'm working, I, I've got a naming convention for how I name my, my PSD and my TIFF files for which is the primary stuff that I, that I, the base material ends up in. Yeah. So if, if I know, if I've completed a work, and we'll call it X, and so there'll be a whole bunch of files that might be, because of a particular theme, be inside of one directory, it'll, it'll have X in the name. And then if I've got something that's derived from that, I actually keep... Um, uh, a catalog of, of where they kind of derive from. Smart. It, it, because there's no other way to do it. Um, I think right now I've only got like the last two or three years roughly cataloged, and it's a it's in my Google Drive. It's a single like you know uh, not a word file, but a Google you know uh, word word file. Yeah. It's about seventy pages long. <laughs> so I just it's like. You know, it's good to keep track of because there are times where you're like, wow, wait a minute, I sourced that from something else. I don't remember what it was. Uh huh. It's why, oh, it came from X. Okay. I, you know, it, otherwise it's, you know, I figure at some point I'm going to croak. Someone in my family might care to like track what Uncle Joseph did. Here we go. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's my sense of immortality. Right. You know, it, Who would have known he would have left us homework? <laughs> <laughs> I have left you as your inheritance an errand. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So that makes a lot of sense. And also I realize too, it's kind of like when you do go flipping through old drawings or sketchbooks, it'll be like, uh, sometimes you'll probably run across something as you're looking going, Oh yeah, that thing. I'll, I'll save that for later. That, that gives oh, me I another idea. Fun. Yeah. I do. That. I, I, I love going through. So I don't know if you're like me. I cannot. Anytime I travel to a new city, if I walk by, an art supply store, mm-hmm. I cannot not walk in. Yeah. And it's almost impossible for me to walk out without something. I know. And I don't need anything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and invariably, if, if I can't find anything else that I really need, I walk out with another sketchbook. Right. And, um, and, and so it's like, I've got dozens and dozens of sketchbooks that are in various states of completion and, you know, yeah, regularly pick one up, just random off the shelf and go, Oh, yeah, I should totally work on that. That would be totally cool to work on this weekend. Yeah, and go do that. I will say yeah. it's it's funny though. I have in the past year definitely leaned more towards the uh, using. I have a tablet that I only use for drawing, like a, literally an Android tablet. It has a pen, and it's all I use it for. And I draw on it. And sometimes I find myself really liking drawing on that more. It used to be that. Um, I, I I would be like, oh, I'll draw it in here just that way. I don't have to ink this later on, or you know, if the, my inking wasn't as good. But now I've gotten so used to drawing on it, it's and and it backs it up and everything. Like I have everything set. Every, every program I use is set to. If I have a drawing, it just saves it to my Google Photos. Um, so so that makes it easier too. So if I ever need it, I, no matter where I am, on then I switch to my phone or my laptop. It's all right there. I don't have to like back it up and save it and all that kind of stuff. So. I'm only just- started dabbling with a pad for, for drawing. Yeah. So I, I still, like in the last three or four months, it's, it's a very new thing for me for actually like starting drawings from, from a pad. Yeah. Um, it's been interesting. I'm not doing it super regularly. Like at least once a week, I'm giving it, giving it a go. I, I think it's because after decades of just knowing how to do it with an actual pencil, right. The, the, the muscle memory of switching to the tools, because there are, I've been playing with Fresco from Adobe and oh. uh, Procreate. Okay. Procreate. Both. Both are pretty good. I, they both have things that I, I find really interesting and likable. They both have certain features and, and stuff, but the muscle memory isn't quite there yet. So that's why I'm, I'm saying I'm, I only just I, I've actually been drawing on a tablet for since 2017, and only just in the past year am I more like, oh, that's way more easy to do on tablet. Like it definitely took me a while. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm definitely way behind on that. I, <laughs> I, I I definitely want to get better. And like I said, there are some definitely cool things that I immediately was like, oh, this is oh, this is something I would. Be, very hard breath to do yeah. with any natural material, but it's, it's, 
it's a total sea change in terms of in terms of thinking. I do like I do like the fact that like both those apps do auto backup. Like you know, if you get out of the file, like you yes. want to save this, you do. You know, it, it's it's and, and um, I'm using the the one of the latest iPads, and I picked it just because uh, a friend of mine had shown me theirs, and they're like, mm. well, I mean, if you, if you want the latest, I'm like, it's been a few years since I had tried anything like the the, the the Apple Pencil. Right. I'm like, oh, this one. This one actually is relatively responsive because that was my biggest gripe for many, many years was you'd write the line and you'd have that like half second, second, second and a half pause and then the line would appear and that, yes. I was like, oh, not acceptable. This no, is, no, not at all. <laughs> like you can't wait. I'm like, it's not about the waiting. It's my brain is already moving on to the next line and I can't move to the next line because it's the, 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 the delta between like it doing stuff. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I no, the latency, on. you can't, you can't just auto accept a latency. Like that's not, it's not natural. And so this one has gotten close enough to where I'm not really noticing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm like, okay, that's acceptable. But I, I'm, I, it's definitely the learning curve. Like I feel, I feel like I'm a, I'm a teenager again, learning you know certain basic things. The thing that's hard too, is there are some things that you can do with analog. Like there are some like, like, first of all, I love your, your figure drawings or your portraits and all that kind of stuff. I love the style that you have. It's one of those things. And I've said this to a few other artists, the style you do with that is the style that like, I wished I could do. And then I finally had to accept I can't. So I love it. And it's, it's one of those things that I always aspired to want to do. And then other things that you do with the portrait is you have the, the way that you do the line art, but then you also have a way of making it look kind of a sporadic thing will happen. The, the most Easy way to describe it is kind of like how you would see those uh, drawings for the Hunter S. Thompson's books, and they'd have the line drawings, and then all of a sudden there's like this weird splatter that just kind of shows that just like pla, you know. And, and it's I love Ralph Steadman. Yeah, there that was the name. I was trying to think of the name, and I'm like, I'm I not even tell. Yeah, but so so I, there I are elements stolen, like that. I have stolen from him pretty pretty judiciously. Okay, there's a couple of, there's a couple of artists that so I steal from everywhere. I, I totally have tried to, it, you know, I, I will not claim to be as good as any of these artists at all, mm-hmm. but I really do believe in the Pablo Picasso. It's like good artists mimic, great artists steal. I've right. just totally admitted it. I am stealing stuff everywhere. So it's like uh, there's a famous comic book artist who I love. He's probably one of my favorite artists, period, a guy named Bill Sienkiewicz. Okay. Um, he got famous He got famous for, for being the first artist, I think, for to, to kind of train wreck Frank Miller. Frank Miller, I guess, used to really like demand right. artists do things a certain way, and he kind of went nah. Yes. Um, and his visual style is is a little bit Ralph Steadman, a little bit Gustav Klimt, a little bit kind of like. Um, oh, I, I think I know who you're talking he, about. Yeah, he did. He did a he did a bunch of comics in the '80s that became super famous, including uh, this very David Lynch kind of comic called Straight Toasters. Mm-hmm. He did Electro Assassin. He did a couple of issues of a series for The Shadow back in the '80s. Oh, nice! Really fascinating guy. And um, and he has that same thing. Like he's a whole bunch of effects where he kind of warps and and because sh- you know I especially when I was an adolescent and early early adult, like I wanted everything to be very realistic. I wanted to get you know that was when I was actually I went to junior college and I started to take serious studio classes and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to get the technique down, and then I got the technique pretty good. I thought you know I wasn't absolutely a plus rock star, but I could I was a solid studio you know draftsman and. And I realized that most of the artists that I really liked seemed to have good technique, but they had stylized to a point where they kind of really went off into their own separate space. That stuff fascinated me more. Yeah. So it was something like Gustav Klimt. I was like, what? like everyone knows the, the kiss, that classic kind of layout. I'm like, that looks so amazing. And mm-hmm. I loved fashion photography for the same reason. I, I can complain about the fact that, you know, there'll be some female model in some weird contorted pose. <laughs> but visually, Visually, it looked fascinating. I'm like, that actually looks kind of cool, you know. And their features will always be always be a little bit strange. And I'm like, oh, I, I I found myself moving that way. And same thing when I when I got into Hunter S. Thompson, and I saw the Ralph Steadman drawings. I'm like, who is this guy? Oh yeah. You know, I think I was, I think I was late in high school, like junior or senior, when I first really started reading him. And I, I you know, you go to the library, pick up the books, and like, these illustrations are amazing. They don't make any sense to me, but they're amazing. And and just start stealing wholesale. Nice. Uh, I, I had to figure out how to break a pen in the right way to make those effects work. Like I was going to you know, ask, so how do you go about doing that? Yeah, it's I'm curious. I have fallen in love with a particular brand of pen. I hope they never go out of 
being made by Pentel. They're called parallel pens. Okay. They are these. They come in about four or five sizes. They have fat nibs. Okay. And they're thin on you know they're they're you can write on either side. So on the long side, you can create really really fat lines, and then you can create super thin lines using the edge. Okay. Um, so it's like that pen that's in in a soft. You'll see that as one of the tools in like software that you never use. There's one that's like that as well, where it's a flat. Okay, I get what you're saying. Yeah. And and the great thing is, if you got the right hand control, you can manipulate it such that if you if you and you got to pick the right paper. This is this is a mistake I had to I, I did. I had to practice figuring this out on different paper surfaces. Okay. Where if the paper's too thin or there's a little bit too much um, tooth in it, it'll mm -hmm. grab the pen and it'll, like, it'll mess up the pen, basically, or it'll just wreck the paper. Hmm. Um, but you can get the, the, you know, it's like trying to slide something across a slightly rough surface and it starts to skip. Oh, yeah. And it creates a lateral effect. And the default ink in it also is uh, water soluble a little bit. So even after you've written the lines, if you want to start to make washes with it, you can just do it straight onto the surface. Huh. It's a really cool kind of kind of it's a it's a it was one of those pens where I'm like what is this thing and you know once again in an art store saw it and went I don't know what that is okay one of them's not too expensive I think, they, I think at the time they were like eight or nine bucks a pop each I'll grab it and dinked around with it for a couple of days wasn't making too great a pro process and then it, I started to really I'm like well okay I don't really care and I started really to mess with it that's when I was like oh this is doing some really interesting stuff. Hmm. Uh, so I bought a few more pens, wrecked a few of them, and then I finally got the physical control to get it so that I could make the pens last. I could get the effects going. They're fun pens. I have I have been. I'd never heard of them before. There, there's a couple of artists that seem to be using them. Uh, I've seen I've seen a couple of YouTube videos of different artists who, who have found them, mm -hmm. uh, and I see them I see them in enough stores that they've got to have some. They've been around for about four or five years, at least as far as I can tell. Yeah, and they they seem like they're still selling so. People are using them. I think more people use them for like calligraphy, which makes than, sense than for illustration. But I I've tried using calligraphy pens for 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 drawing, and most of them don't work out for me. They're a little bit too rigid. They don't they they don't splatter in a very interesting way. They just kind of go, um, <laughs> and they're expensive, right? So these are right. pens that are relatively affordable that you can manipulate a little bit um, and do cool stuff. And I'm sort of like I I am totally there's there's certain things. I don't know if you're like this, you know, there are certain materials you must have mm -hmm. to do what you do. And then there's other stuff that's optional. I've got a small cluster of things I must have. Like when I'm doing portraits for, for skin tones, I always use a blue base and it's always gouache and it's always from Holbein and it's always ash blue. Oh, it's wow. a non-negotiable. Non <laughs> um, every other color goes on top, that's fine, but I start there. So all of my portraits always start like in their work in progress. They have kind of almost a, a, a phantasm ghost-like effect as they're kind of being being built up. Okay. And and sometimes I leave them that way. They they end up looking okay, but I it's it's just it's now it's got to work that way. I've tried doing other things. And I'm like, nope, that's whatever it is. That is my thing. Huh. Uh, so these these pens are now part of the you know I've got to use them periodically because it's definitely like my drawing style very much feels natural using these pens. Um, Credit Color makes these graphite pencils that I am totally in love with, and I've used them for the better part of a decade. They're like, I don't see myself ever getting tired of them. Okay. Graphite pencil that isn't super messy, but has a really great, um, like the depth of the black in, in, in like a standard, right. you know, 2B. It's like, wow, this is great. Like, I, I have not found, and the coatings on the outside of them, it's like these, um, you know, they're they're the coating on the outside. You don't get your hands all dirty. You don't, um, you know, they they sharpen really easily. Oh, and they don't like they don't all fall apart in the pencil sharpener. That's everyone's favorite. Where you're like, oh you, I God, bought a pencil, yeah. a third of it, and the other two thirds is inside as shavings. Yeah. So, yeah, I love to experiment with materials and find ones. When when I find one that's remotely working for me, I latch onto that thing like nobody's business. One of the few other bits of luck living in the Bay Area, where we've got tons of art stores here. Right. Um, you know, all the universities and there's several art schools in the area. There's, you know, there's the Art Institute. Most people know about that. But San Jose State, which is just down the street from here, Stanford, Berkeley, like all these, all these universities have big art departments of their own. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of art supply stores. And when I was a kid, like I'd go through all of them. It's like, oh, here's Flax and here's Amsterdam art. And here, you know, just do the, the tour. Yeah. So I, I, kept, I kept picking stuff up and, and, um, because otherwise, you, I don't think you would find this stuff. I mean, maybe now you would because Amazon lets you kind of... But figuring out what actually is... 
I have a hard time buying stuff off of Amazon unless I know what I'm buying. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I get yeah. that. I'm like, is this what I want? You know, it's it's not because you're like looking at the photograph. I'm like, is that actually what I'm going to get? Right. I've made I've made some impulse purchases off of Amazon that I later regretted profoundly. Yeah. And with the uh, with the new year opening up and being able to go out there and do stuff, like what kind of things do you have coming up uh, artistically this year? Uh, I'm I'm just starting to try to figure out a couple of projects that have been kind of stewing right before the whole COVID lockdown. Because actually, my studio was closed for most of the COVID period. Like right. It was, it was the building was basically effectively locked down. Um, I did my first real mural just, uh, you know, uh, a short while ago. So I'm, I'm thinking of trying to do another one of those. Is that the San I had, Jose I had one? Always been, yeah, there's one. Uh, there, well, there's a mural inside a, a Portuguese restaurant here called Petiscuch, which is, uh, uh, it's, the, San Jose has only had one Michelin starred restaurant in its history. It happens to be a Portuguese restaurant. Oh, nice. Uh, and me being Portuguese, we interested in that place. So I ate there a lot and whatnot. Uh, the restaurant group that started that has started a casual dining spot quite literally on my block down at the other end of my, my block. Cool. And they, true story, they had come and pinged me on Instagram because they, they were just, I think they were just looking for artists and they saw that a, I was Portuguese, B, I was an artist, C, I was in the area. Would I be interested in doing work? And this was during the beginning of COVID when they when they had asked me and I said sure let's let's meet up and talk either through Zoom or whatever they're like you want to meet us at the restaurant we can we can be socially distanced so I met them at their original restaurant and sat like you know three table lengths apart and the second I walked in like quite literally one of them went oh it's you because they had seen me inside they're like oh you're that guy I'm like, yeah <laughs> that guy I was absolutely ecstatic so I got a chance to do it but it was it was a very daunting project because I had never done anything bigger than like six by nine feet oh okay and this was like seven. 17- 17 by 30 and I'm like I don't even know how to like and it was a very strange shaped wall and everything uh, fortunately one of the guys in local color a guy named Ben Henderson is an expert at this stuff and oh. so I basically uh, subcontracted him as my project manager and clue provider to make sure I could take what I had as a vision for the wall that, that the the client agreed to and they go can we make this thing go on that and he was like sure because of course he's good at this stuff and he, he helped you know, kind of, you know, I'm not scared to ask for help for people who are clearly, you know, experts in a particular domain. I'm like, no, please, I, I would like a clue provided. And um, and so, you know, three weeks of planning and three days of constant work, and it came up, and it actually it actually landed really, really nicely. So I'd like to, I, I think I'd like to do a project like that again. Um, I've had an idea for a graphic novel for the last several years that I've started sketching some stuff out for. Okay. Um, it'll probably be like at least a year to a year and a half let me steady work, but it'll be, it'll be, I, I've always wanted to try the idea. I've inked people's work before. I like doing inking um, on stuff like that, but I tend to obliterate other people's work. So it, it, I don't get asked much anymore. Um, <laughs> you don't, you don't adhere to the uh, pencil drawings. I, I do in spirit, but not necessarily in, in tactical finish. Okay. Right? It's like, gotcha. it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm trying to think of like a really good example. Like, you know, if, if Ralph Steadman inked your pencils as a comic artist, at some point you're gonna guess it's gonna look a little bit like Ralph Steadman. Yes. It might still look like your stuff from 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 a narrative perspective. It's probably gonna look a little bit like Ralph. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of the same way. Like it's really hard for me to just like follow the line. They can't quite do it perfectly that way. Yeah. Um you know, I I have a couple of commissions going on right now for for portraits. I I've done a lot of jazz portraits, so I got a I got a guy who uh, asked me for a picture of um, a famous trombonist named Wyclef Gordon. So uh, I'm doing one of a guy named Charles Mingus. So I've, I've, I've got a couple smaller things in the pipe. I'm still trying to figure out what new normal is. Mm-hmm. Um, I have worked throughout you know, my, my day job throughout the whole period, kind of cooped up at home, and I've kind of moved part of my studio back into here in my cramped little loft. Right. Um, to do some things, but like bigger stuff has still been, I've just totally put off and not accepted any requests. Cause I'm like, I really don't have, I've just only in the last couple of weeks gotten the facility space back to start doing that again. So I've got to kind of start doing the rounds and going, I'm, I'm, I'm doing commissions now. Give me a ring. Mm-hmm. Um, but beyond that, I haven't, I haven't quite figured out what the new run rate or what new normal is going to be. Okay. But that's, that's the kind of stuff in the pipe. I, I have been working for a decade now on my own coffee table book. It's like one of those vanity projects. You're like, if I croak, can I leave at least one thing? It kind of goes, this is what I'm about. And What's and so the I subject keep... matter of the coffee table book? 
I just kind of a, a I, I had enough people over the years who asked me like, how do you how do you do what you do? I'm like, oh, happy to explain it. I have no secrets. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you want to understand how I go about doing my work or where I get my ideas from, like most of my ideas, uh, I listen to music every waking second of the day. I title most of my abstract paintings based on whatever I was listening to at the time that I finished. Okay. Sometimes people will recognize a, ly- a lyric fragment or the name of an album or something, and they're like, are you a fan of it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. <laughs> I was totally listening to that when I finished it, yes. Um, and my tastes are really varied, which probably reflects the art, too. It's like, I'll start the day listening to Miles Davis and end the day listening to Helmet, and it, it that's a totally normal thing for me. Right. Um, so... I just thought, oh, you know, people keep asking me certain questions over and over again. Sometimes it's a technique thing, like, you know, what pens do you use? Or, you know, uh, my favorite these days is I have friends who are becoming parents and their right. kids are four or five and wanting to draw. They're like, what, what materials do you recommend I get my kid? I'm like, get eight and a half by 11 paper and a number two pencil. Yeah. Start easy. Right? If, they, if they're not going to use a pad, like a, an iPad or an Android pad, start, start them on, like, like, you don't have to buy expensive materials. You don't have to, like... They're five. They don't need cold press board. They don't need, like, just let them figure out what they want to draw first. And if they like doing it continuously, then you can move up the, the, the expense chain as a parent. Right. Um, you know, but they, you know, there's a, I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll just explain all this crap, and I'll put a bunch of my drawings and paintings in it, and, you know, that'll be my, my, my ego-stroking project. Um, you know, I, and I see more and more people now with the ability to self-publish that it actually seems like a viable idea. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to have kind of like a collection of your own stuff. I mean, I, we as artists, let's face it, we do have egos. We do, we, you know, like this is something we would want to do. I'm not expecting to all of a sudden become, you know, the, the, the next Salvador Dali, but it'd be nice to have. It's like, okay, cool. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm definitely my own books that I publish as biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> I love some of the strips you have. Cause I remember, I think the first time I saw one of your strips was probably not even a year ago, but it was, it was, I laughed so out loud. Oh, when really? I saw it was a strip and it was about, it was about CK1 and the TV series Friends, because I hate the TV series Friends. <laughs> right. I, I, I'm sorry, I have to admit that a lot. But when, the way you had set that strip up, I'm like, that is some of the funniest crap I've read in a long time, because it, it was a perfect distillation in four panels <laughs> of that era so perfectly. Right. And I'm like, and I had CK1. Yeah. Um, so did I. <laughs> I was like, wow, that is so like the way it was lined up. I'm like, that is perfect. Yeah. So, no, it was an actual conversation I had that day. Cause that's the thing is like some of my stuff is funny and some of it's not because it's actually just like, well, let me think of something interesting that happened today. And sometimes it's just like, I try not to do too much about like, you know, uh, being upset about things. That's how the whole thing started. Or at least it was trying to persevere through that. But, um, but now it's just kind of like, I don't know. I just think back and the, sometimes it's like a dumb conversation. I'll have her a stupid thought. And I think one of them was about CK one. Cause I, I, I want to say it was something like I smelled CK one and I was just like, I haven't smelled that in a while. Yeah. I can't remember it, but I know what one you're talking about, but Oh, well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, when I, when I, when you would put out the call, like, Hey, do you want to be on the podcast? I'm like, Oh, I totally want to be on the podcast. Yeah. You know, like, I, I think what you're doing is great work. Oh, thank right? you. Like, I think, I think, I think so much of what, like, even in my own feed on Instagram, like half the stuff I get now is like pay to play. Yeah. And it's very kind of self-serving and doesn't feel natural where your interviews. And I think that like the fact that you pick such a broad array of people from like, once again, it's, it's the, let's just look at all the different, facets and permutations of this what it's like to be an artist like uh-huh. um, and just see where the conversations go which I find for lack of a better description a really novel thing to do yeah thanks yeah uh, no and and I find that I meet more interesting people I mean literally you you can attest to this I just said hey sign up to be on the podcast and you did and I was like great can you do this day you know it's, it's good no I'm I'm really glad and then uh when uh, or sorry not when what would you say is the place people should go to check out your stuff um so from a purely like if you just want to see whatever it is I'm doing at a particular moment the Instagram handle is Zeruch Z-E-R-U-C-H uh that's the handle I use for most things so I've got 
you know, I whore myself out on Society6 and Redbubble and a whole bunch of other services. Society6 is probably the primary one. Okay. Um, if people are into still, still into DeviantArt, I still have my account there. I'm a former gallery director at DeviantArt. I'm, yeah, you know, I saw that. Many, 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 many years ago, back, I think it was 2004 to 2008. Before they got bought by Wix. Long before they got bought by Wix. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, the Wix purchase has facilitated some good things on that site. It has. And not so good things. Right. Yeah. It's a half and half. I've, I've always had a, like with uh, DeviantArt, it's always like, I, f I just forget about it. It's like the opera browser. It's like, oh yeah, that thing. And then you look at it again. And it's like, oh yeah, this is really neat. And then all of a sudden you're like, you just forget about it again. Like you just stop using it. Like all of a sudden it's like, oh, what's that over there? And then it, I used it religiously for years and, and it's management never quite figured out that you are a social network. You should act like one. Yeah. Right. You really built because the community was one of the best parts. Like I have, mm -hmm. I have made quite a few real life friends from, I, it's the only network that I've really made a significant number of real life friends. I actually went to a wedding last year of someone who I, I jokingly refer to as my muse emeritus. Wow. I drew her face more than any other person, uh, you know, short of my girlfriend at the time. Like she just had a fantastic look. I loved doing portraits of her and we became just normal friends just online for years and years and years and years. And then one day I said, Oh, I'm having, you know, I'm doing a business trip to Montreal. You know, you want me to fly through Calgary on the way home? Do you want to actually like meet? And she's like, sure. Met, met met her then fiance, uh, got along just as well in real life as we did online. Yeah. And then a year later, she said, do you want to come to my wedding? And I'm like, yeah. You know, and I'm her wedding. And I was just like, this is really cool. And DeviantArt facilitated that. I've got hmm. I've got quite a few friends. I know that if I ever travel to Scotland, I've got someone someone whose house I can you know slum in for a couple of days while I go while I go grab scotch. Like th these are the kinds of things where you're like, this is the good part of the internet. Yeah. Right. And, and so a site like DeviantArt had a really good community for a very long time. And I'm glad that I was there during that arc uh, because I haven't found anything that's like that since. I agree. None of the other none of the other art sites really have it. Like I love Society6 for their service. The quality of most of like their print quality is very, very good. Oh, some okay. of the other some of the other like their phone cases are pretty solid. Uh, I haven't bought any of the clothing or furniture that they have. But, you know, I've heard good things They're you know, like. So they're making good, like they're not like Cafe Press. They're making good quality, right. you know, like just in time manufacturing stuff. Redbubble does a pretty good job. Um, DeviantArt's prints are very good. I, I still stand by the, the the quality of their print work. But um, but anything outside of DeviantArt in terms of their their print service, none of them have, I think, a really good community aspect to it. It's all really about like we will print your art, we will provide the logistics and the e-commerce for it. You don't mm -hmm. have to worry about any of that stuff. You get your cut of the profits. Which I hear a lot of people complain about. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm selling this phone case. It's twenty five, twenty six bucks. I'm only getting two bucks or three bucks. So like, isn't that isn't that like horrible? I'm like, no. I've already made the artwork. The artwork right. was made for the phone case. The artwork was made for my own edification. I'm now syndicating it to this other service where I might make a couple of additional dollars off of it if, if it's interesting to people. Yeah. This company is going to make these. I don't have to order in bulk fifty, a hundred. You know, like they're going to make it just in time as as needed. They're going to do all the logistics, all the RMI in case it's a it gets broken in transit. They'll handle all the, the customer service. They will do all the e-commerce transaction stuff, and I just get a deposit in my PayPal. Mm -hmm. That's free money. Yeah. Me, yeah. Yeah, right? and like also it, on top of it, think of it this way: do then try to attempt to sell more than one is another good method. I mean, looking at it as a singular sale, going, I'm only going to make two dollars off of this. It's like but sell 10 of them, which you again, still don't have to make that's done for you. You sit in the background and do that every day. Then you're making it. You're making more. It's, it's math. I don't know. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to describe yeah. it, but you know, the more you sell, the better it is. And again, it's, it's no effort from the person that creates it. It's no effort from me, you know, to, to do anything more. Oh yeah. No, I, I totally love those services for that reason. It's like, I'm going to do art no matter what. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's that's it's, what I was trying to say. Yeah. I'm going to make it anyway. <laughs> it's, it's not a hobby. It's not a side hustle. It's a compulsion. Like yeah. it really is. I happen to like commerce as well. I mean, I, 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 I'm happy to admit I'm a horrible capitalist. I want to, you know, if I can make a few pennies off of what I, of my efforts, I'd be more than happy to because yeah. commissions are nice because I can pick them, but um, they're not the primary driver for doing this either. It's just that I, 
I've been lucky that I can pick the ones that I'm interested in. Yeah. But if somebody's creating a, an avenue for me to promote my work or otherwise, like I, I've actually gotten more licensing offers from people who found my work in those places. Like I don't need a phone case, but I, I have a, a book cover and I would like to use this art for it. Oh. Let's discuss that. And, you know, I license pretty cheaply because I've already done the work. So it's like, I'm not going to charge you like ridiculous, if, especially like the only people who ever asked me, I've, I've never had like Justin Bieber ask me for anything. I've had people who are like, I'm a local author on, on this, on this, you know, uh, boutique publisher or, um, I think one of my favorites was I, I did this abstract work that I always really liked and kind of sat relatively obscurely. And then this little Australian band, indie band said, we'd like to use this for, we can't afford a whole lot. We'd like to use this for our little EP cover. I said, well, yeah. <clears throat> I'll charge you a hundred bucks US and two copies of the CD signed. Nice. And they're like, that is great. I mean, cause they really were like, there was just a little tiny local band out of, I think Melbourne and the music was actually pretty good. I was kind of like for a couple, you know, for a while after I was like, you know, it's got my art, but listen to this. It's actually pretty good. Right. So it's, it, it's, it's always a, a good bonus. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, and he's like, at that point, it's once again, it's gravy. I've already done the work. The work's been sitting there for a year or two. Mm-hmm. Someone has decided they really like it for a totally different purpose. They've come to me and, and asked permission, and, and I'm like, okay, here's a contract. Sign it off. Great. You've sent me my stuff. You go forth and be awesome. Right? Works out really, really well, and, and you know, I love that stuff, and, and, and it's low friction. Yeah. The internet facilitates making that totally low friction. So, yeah. Sorry. No. Tangent. That's all right. I, I do it all the time. <laughs> so what this show is, is tangents. But I do want to thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm really glad that we got the chance to meet. Thank you for having me. 